Hello and welcome to Movie of the Year 1997 Part 1 of Finale. That's what we're doing, folks. We finale are here, and we are going to, by the end of not this episode, but the episode after this, pick 1997's Movie of the Year. When we wrap today, we will have our four finalists. Ryan, best friend, back me up on this. It's true, Greg. I think that you should still listen to this entire episode. Yeah. Uh, not just, like, skip this one wait for next week. Yeah, no. First of all, you're going to have an awful week. And don't, like, text us to see what the winner is no. before next week. We're not going to tell you. And that's another thing. Don't text us to ask us your opinions on movies. Right. You have to have the opinions, you guys. Or listen to the show. Yeah. We'll tell you during the show what your opinion is. But not are. outside yeah, the show. That's not our job. We're paid for being on the show. Joining us, as always, is Mike. Mike, hello. How are you doing, buddy? I'm doing great. I'm ready to fight. I'm ready to become best friend. Okay, that's I'm not um, yeah, that's oof, this is so awkward. What's but wrong? That's not on the that's not on the table today. Oh. Mike. Yeah, I guess I'll talk about movies or whatever then. Yeah, Who today. Today we are so invested, and Taylor, you're also here, but don't say anything. Today we are so invested in picking the movie of the year that I can't have my mind off in other places trying to figure out who the best friend is. And not to, like not to be that guy, but like it's off the table for this part of the season. But really, for Mike and Taylor, it was off the table the entire season. If, is, we, if we look back at it, Taylor, that seems hurtful. Do you agree? And feel free to weigh in. Uh, finale larder, first of all, that's what we're calling this episode. <laughs> Um, and also, yeah, I feel, I feel like I agree entirely with that. It was always off the table. I was never going to get that prize. Yeah. Much like, much like my place in heaven. I was never going to achieve it. I it's have a, sh- a theory. What's your theory, because, Mike? Because I do feel like in seasons past, there, there was fighting chances for Taylor and I, but I think I might, I'm not, I don't know the, your pop filter historical records by heart, but I have a feeling this is about the time, 1997, when you two met. So all of this was so formative <laughs> that your nuts were just wrapped together. And so, f- fucking course, in 1997, Taylor and I never could crack that shit. R- Ryan, they seem to be insinuating here that because most of the questions I ask in this show are actually in-jokes about our shared history right. that they don't have any access like, to. Like, long before Mike and Taylor were born. Yeah, uh-huh. and which I assume plays very well with our audience, who uh-huh. is more than just you and me, that for some- somehow that gives you an advantage. Does that... Do you, you know agree what? with that? When uh, people start emailing in and say, enough with Sunset Riders, uh-huh. references, then we'll stop. Marry me with my money. I, I have to do that every day anyway, so I just do it sometimes on the show. Yeah. But until we get those emails, it's going to be all Sunset Riders references. I'm sorry, dude. Well, first of all, you play Sunset Riders and tell me that you can just move on from right. that. You can just get over that in the rest of your life. Guys, I think we are all avoiding thinking about something. And that's why we're having these shenanigans here. But are you guys nervous about having to pick 1997's movie of the year? Not at all. I think this is going to be very easy. Mostly because I'm not invested. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, was fi- I was five years old in 1997, so these mean mostly nothing to me. You still watched all of these movies. I like, sure did. I spent a lot of time with them, and I really enjoyed like it. This represents like 20 hours of your labor so far. <laughs> That's useless to me. I don't give a <laughs> fuck about my own time. Plus, Ru- we, we saw on Taylor's face, once he thought of that uh, finale larder thing, yeah. he, he was just checked out for the rest of the show. <laughs> he did I'm his done. job. I'm good. Mike, are you excited? Yeah, to my pick stomach ulcers can't handle finales. It hurts so bad. I'm just going to be chugging Pepto Bismol while screaming at you guys. For me, it has nothing to do with 97. For me, it's just we mm-hmm. have to choose. Like, this stays with us forever, you guys. We are building out a nice little stable of movies of the year. Let's go over our, our movies of the year. So, the original winner was Fight Club. Am I right, Ryan? <laughs> that was, it was, yes. The first, our first season, we did 1999, and the winner was Eyes Wide Shut. Yes. Right? Correct. Uh, next season, we did we jump to 2004. Four. And it was uh, Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. Then it was 2018, and it was Roma. Which broke the streak of movies that start with E. <laughs> A lot of people said it couldn't be done. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then, of course, last year we did 88, and that was Die Hard. So well, it's becoming a, a little bit of a stable of movies here, and... I don't want to mess that up. I want to have a good streak. Do you have one that you think if it made it in, we would have messed it up? It, like, if one of these movies... Or, or like, is there a movie that you think could have been better than any of those? No? Um, I think that what might have really messed it up is if we picked... <laughs> yeah, that would have fucked that up. <laughs> yeah. No street yeah. anymore. But I definitely think there's... Some movies, I won't give a number because I don't want to like 
shit on part of the movies, but there is a, a number of movies that we're going that are like going to compete tonight that will stand up against those previous winners. Yeah, like we're going to hopefully put something in that mm-hmm. like it'll all be of the same caliber. Oh, for this year, yeah. Like I think yeah. I think if we like. I think if we got to the end. We were like Titanic. We did it. You're the best movie, Titanic. Um, yeah. That would be that would be pretty disappointing. It would it would have changed our criteria for what makes a movie of the year. Yeah, um, which is like, it's that's a good thing to bring up is that when we are going from the top 32 on Letterboxd all the way to the eight that we cover, that we're we're taking into consideration a lot of like how iconic and how big they were for the time, how yeah. big they are still today. We're throwing all that out the window. Like yeah. now, it's just what we think is great. Yeah, that, I mean that's just ha- that's what has happened, and you know we've kind of built up what the criteria for movies on this show, all, what the criteria is, and it's that's what it's become. It's become the ones that really blow us away and, and make us happy. But yeah, you get to the dance by just being sort of popular. I mean, we did it immediately when we like we thought that it was going every year was going to be its own Titanic, and then the first year we were like, <laughs> yeah. Eyes wide shut one. Yeah. Uh, okay, so yeah. that's how we do it then. Yeah, yeah. That we have to be true to ourselves, you guys. We have to be true to ourselves. Well, that is the end of the segment we call the introduction to the show. And now we are moving on to the show proper. Okay, speaking of being nervous, we're just, we're just getting into it, you guys. Usually we have a little bit of a buffer where we pretend like we're not going to talk about the movie. Instead, we talk about mountains or something like that. But now we're just jumping right in there. And the movie's... For round one, battle one, are Titanic versus L.A. Confidential. So right away, one of these movies is going to be sunk. Whoa! Not to dang. give it any away. Oh, man. I, I felt my point hand like kind of kind of move on that, like a twitch. Like, oh, I'm going to give him the point. But I can't. Obviously, we're not doing points today. I, whoever's going to win this is currently Confidential. Oh, shut up, damn. Taylor. I almost you shut up. Damn. The loser will be eating crow. Comma Russell, Mike, you- star of LA Confidential. So, these, mo- <laughs> these movies, <laughs> you know what? You saved it. Yeah. You saved it. Okay, this is right where you can see our like criteria manifest themselves. Right? What was a bigger movie in '97, Titanic or LA Confidential? <laughs> LA Confidential. All the teeny bopper girls were just like, "Give us more LA Confidential." I need noir twists. LA Confidential. <laughs> yeah, the, I mean the Katy Perry song over the credits was yeah. amazing. Uh, Mike, you. Uh, Missed the Titanic show. I did. Yeah, uh, do you have a doctor's note or anything for that? I, I do. My mom said she mailed it to you guys. Did she not? Uh, my mom's I, my doctor. Doctor mom. Some kids <laughs> are homeschooled. <laughs> some kids are home doctored. I did have a guy who he taught a class briefly in our college. He told us both of his parents had PhDs, and they made him call them Dr. Mom and oh. Dr. Dad. So they're, like, I, they're like, I didn't go to, cl- go to school for 12 years for you to call me Dad. Oh, my God. <laughs> That's either the the shittiest parents in the world or the fucking funniest best parents. Can't they're just I, they're just bidding. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think we should talk about. Let's say Titanic. Let's let's say a couple things about Titanic. Yeah. It was an entertaining movie, right? Nobody hated it when we watched it this time, correct? I I wouldn't say I hated it. It is a long movie that it's very irritates long. me. <laughs> <laughs> Taylor, do you think because you you were the most down on it? Uh... Do you think you could, like, toe for grace it up? Could you take the three hours we got and edit together to, like, a rip-roaring good time you love? I think so. I think the the biggest thing is cut out all of the shit with uh, Bill Paxton and, like, the old lady. What? I yeah. don't think that that's of it. Like, or, Make or, it be a movie about about the Titanic, not or, about, like, finding or it. Or cut their love scene? Or even <laughs> or cut that stuff down to, like five minutes total between the beginning and the end of the movie and then they're just like hey old lady weren't you on this ship and she's like sure was and I sure let me tell you uh, like I, I think you cut all of that stuff out because there's like 45 minutes of that in the movie for me you're gonna have movie. to add in a lot more Fabrizio content yes. so I you're gonna more... get you're gonna be adding time that way I, I need more I need more Brizio. you need more Brits. Uh and I yeah I think cut that stuff down and Spend maybe even a little bit less time on the sinking of the Titanic, even though that is like the big action set piece. They did cut the ship in half. Was no. that not enough for you? Did would you? No, want I would like I would like thirds. <laughs> That's your toe for Grace Titanic. What would your Will and Grace Titanic be? My Will and Grace Titanic would be more uh, wacky Sean Hayes everywhere. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. dude, just Sean Hayes. There's four never, days. There's, it's never too much, dude. I took one of those uh, "What celebrity do you look like?" things one time, and it told me Sean Hayes, and I was like, eh, okay. <laughs> I would, I would say, I, I would say Tom Holland, but yeah. I'm not an internet quiz, and therefore I don't have any say. No, in this. Greg, you have the most say. 
Um, this movie also gave us a lot of, uh, chem- like, or did it give us any chemistry between the two main characters? That was uh, the main thing, my takeaway from watching it this time, was to feel like they had nothing for each other. No, absolutely not. They were together because the movie said that they should be together. Uh-huh. I feel like they were both giving good performances, but, like, they were on, they were on different <laughs> ships, if you Just, will. Like, she was on the front half, and he was Passing on the second the half. yeah. He he was on he was king of the world and she was on the poop deck. Was there not enough room on the relationship door for both of them? Is that what you're saying? I, you know what? Yeah, because you put it so eloquently. Yes, <laughs> I will say that that is the thing that That's I. That's hilarious. Before. Did you just come up with that? I did. Wow. I just came up with That's that. I just funny. I just thought of it. Well, guys, I think I'm gonna move ahead and just say it's time to vote on these movies because nothing I have heard from any of you makes me think that. The Titanic has any chance. So, Mike, do you vote for the Titanic or uh, LA like Confidential? Confidently. Ryan, do you, do you think the movie would have had a better chance if it were called the Titanic instead of just Titanic? Oh, for sure, yeah. But that's not the case, so which do you vote right. for? Uh, or if it was that whole, like, I love the bands that have Anna. So if it was like Titanic and the Titanic and the Icebergs or uh-huh. something like that. Titanic but and the Pips. It's not called that, so LA Confidential. And Taylor? Uh, LA Confidential all the way. yeah. Very much more of a, a our type of movie, and hopefully in the next round, we will say one or two things about it. When we come back, it's award season! I am holding in my hand right now the Best Supporting Actor winner, but the way we do this is actually we read the nominees first. Mm. Um, so I'm not going to open it, even though I can feel like everything in me saying, like, open this up and just look at it, and then you'll know, and then you can you can tell people. It's like Christmas. You don't open the present until you say everything that was on your Christmas list. Exactly. And then you see what's inside. <laughs> and oh, watch crap. your pants just sweat. Oh, damn. All we got him was a bunch of yarn. Uh, so, Ryan, I'm going to throw to you here. Who are our nominees for Best Supporting Actor? Your best supporting actor nominees are Robert Forster for Jackie Brown, Philip Seymour. Oh, go ahead, Jackie. Robert Forster, guys. What do you think? Oh, fantastic. Okay, so we'll talk about Robert Forster. Yeah. Uh, I didn't like. I didn't know who he was in like his first life, so uh, I only got to see this like him like return to, to glory. But he really did, and I thought a cool thing about it, and we talked about it on the show, was they kind of like wrote parts of him into the character, including that he had like hair replacement surgery or mm-hmm. plugs or whatever and honestly like i don't know why that seems like a minor detail but it like that really resonated with me that he's like no this is how i feel about it this is how the character should feel about it i am an an eight like i'm an i'm getting older so let me tell you young director quentin tarantino like this is the kind of thing i think about let's put it in the character i thought that was really rad there's not a lot of uh, vulnerability in Tarantino's movies. He's never been accused of having that. And Forrester injected so much into this character who doesn't have a lot to do. He's kind of there just to yeah. help Jackie Brown. But he, he injects so much into that character. Yeah, it's so true. Yeah, it's I like great. that. I mean, he is playing an older character, but it's none of that, like, uh, Space Cowboys, Last Vegas, look at all the jokes that we're making yeah. about how, like, the old man gets another chance. Like, it's so it's the most realistic part about any quentin tarantino movie really yeah well good luck to you robert forcer I, I honestly guys i hope he wins so i'll just i'll just open this on up and see if he's the one who won ryan i mean he did just die so it's sort he, of a slam dunk he yeah. also did just, he die, did just die which R. i R. am sure i didn't think about at all as i immediately moved his name up to the top of the ballot upon seeing it before you do that greg do you remember philip seymour hoffman in boogie nights uh now he died too long ago yeah yep <laughs> like <laughs> Doesn't we don't yeah, give a dude, shit that anymore. was forever the ago. The grace period's over. <laughs> uh, I, Philip Seymour Hoffman was a character who I loved in Boogie Nights so much so that I wish there was more of him in Boogie Nights. This is like I think that this is probably too little of screen time to typically get nominated. Like yeah. I think that really speaks to the performance. Uh, this is some Dame Judy Dench level shit going on. He broke my fucking heart, dude. Watching uh, it this time, it w- that was like that's the most painful part of the movie. And there's a lot of pain in this movie. But, like, watching him berate himself for how stupid he is, Ugh. holy cow, very, very tough stuff. All right, Ryan, who is next up on the old list? The Still Alive. Oof. John C. Riley Boo. from Boogie Nights. Boo. Okay. Get out of here, you living fuck. For the record, how much longer is this guy really going to be alive? Yeah, that's true, right? Right? <laughs> it's kind of a big dude. If I've got anything to say about it, not much longer. <laughs> Oh shit! He's uh he's really good in this, and I feel like since that time he does like he'll do one movie where he's absolutely absurd, 
Yeah. And then the next movie where it's like got dramatic chops, and then the next movie absolutely absurd. That's, He's managed to have like uh, both of those things. John C. Riley's entire career confuses me because the first time I ever saw him was Talladega Nights, uh-huh. and I was like, "This is the Ballad of Ricky Bobby." The Ballad of Ricky Bobby, and I was like, "This is the first movie that I saw both him and Amy Adams in." Yeah. So I was just like, my entire like frame of reference for these two actors was that they do this. Uh huh. And now I like John C. Riley in this movie, a weird goofball, but also like a ton of heart. Yeah. Like I love him in this. Yeah, after Talladega Nights, he saw The Vampire's Assistant, and he went, wow, this guy should be nominated for Oscars. <laughs> this is fucking crushing it. And rewatching Boogie Nights 20 years later, it does seem like, all right, I can't keep making movies with Dirt Diggler. Will Ferrell, you're going to be my Dirt Diggler for the rest of my career. You're my new Dirty Diggs. Your next one is the recently deceased Burt Reynolds from Boogie Nights. Holy shit, dude. These supporting actors dropping like flies. <laughs> Do you think we have a curse? If you get nominated for our supporting actor, you will die? That's why I only take lead roles. He has a lot of screen time in this movie, and it almost feels like you could argue that this movie is about him as much as it is anybody else. I think if Clint Eastwood had directed this movie, this would be a movie about Burt Reynolds' character. Uh Uh-huh. Like, like, that's the type of thing that Clint Eastwood likes to do. I think Paul Thomas Anderson pulled back from that a little bit, but you're right. Like, he has arguably, I think, behind Dirk, more screen time than anyone. Yeah, yeah. And you expect to find him, like, completely ripped to shreds, but instead he gets as exonerated and as uplifted by the end of the movie as anybody else. He, like, really, he gets shown at the end of the movie, it feels like, to really be, like, grandpapa of this whole kind yeah. of family bound together just by love. Yeah, he does not learn that, like, you're, you're a dirty pervert and yeah. you should pay for it, but instead, if you stick with your family, eventually you'll get to yeah. do the walk through the house with your family. He might have, overall, the happiest story arc of anyone in the movie. Yeah. Like, I think everyone else has lower lows than he ever gets They have to. lower lows, but it's also because they learn lessons, and he, he just doesn't, so, yeah. like, <laughs> he would have low lows if he, he refuses. looked down at his navel at all, but instead he's just, like, the worst- doing it right. The worst thing that happens to him in the entire movie is someone's like, you're a hack and you always have been. And he's like, I'm so offended. Yeah. Everybody else like loses family. Limbs. <laughs> and again, that was the worst acting that he did because that he just turned into normal Burt Reynolds <laughs> yeah. and started to fight people. He just ad-libbed that. <laughs> That's where his character was supposed to reflect, but instead he just hauled <laughs> off and punched that dude. And your final nominee is the recently deceased and winner of the 97 Oscar for Best Sporting Actor, Robin Williams from Good Will Hunting. Oh, shit. Robbie Will. He is good in this. He is good in this. If this was for Aladdin, for sure. He puts so much humor and soul (laughs) in Aladdin. Uh, I think he's hamstrung here. He's good in a movie that's a movie. I I feel like in a a movie that is a movie... um, (laughs) Uh, I I think most people are just fine. I feel like Robin Williams was... He's the reason that anyone gives a shit about this movie. He really elevated the material, didn't he? Sometimes you could really see him trying very hard. I felt like in the speech about the Sistine Chapel, I felt like you could really see him like trying to make this stuff work, and it doesn't, so then the work looks bad on his part. But for the rest of it, I, I felt like he delivered most of his monologues really well. Yeah, and and I felt like he brought a lot of like his own real life sort of like pain into it, and uh-huh. you could like see it on his face and like feel it. And I really appreciated that in his performance. I thought it was great, but not the best performance in the movie. What? What's the best performance in the movie? Casey Affleck, guys. He's hilarious. It's clearly he Mini Driver. It's clearly Mini Driver. And he went method. Is... <laughs> Listen, we're not sure. That he fucked that glove. Uh, guys, he did not fuck the glove. He 100% he, said he jizzed into it then. He jizzed, yeah. he jizzed into the glove, but he did not... The glove was not part of the stimulation. Okay, so when you jizz into something, Taylor, don't, Taylor said, don't call it fucking. That yes. is making love. Yes. That's what he did. <laughs> All right, are you guys ready? Yes. Yeah. Okay. See Hang on. See if you can love. hear me opening the envelope. I heard the shit out of Whoa. that. <laughs> we did. Yeah. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> and the winner is... Robert Forrester for Jackie Brown. Congratulations. Robert, listen, come on down. Pick up the yeah, sword. Do you guys are shaking your head? No. No, don't don't bring him down. I I like I thought this was Burt Reynolds slam dunk. Yeah. I really did. I think it's because he just died, dude. I really do. I mean like, that and this was a very good performance. Like him walking through the record store to buy a cassette tape that he heard in Jackie Brown's apartment. 
That was just like a very small, like very yeah. nice moment, and like he brought a lot of humanity. To Plus, that think about who we are as people. Like we don't, we're not like uh, Jack from Boogie Nights types that flies off the handle. Uh, we're more uh, the guys who like uh, see a girl far away, think she's very hot, and do nothing about it. Yeah, very quiet. So it makes sense that we voted for him. Well, speaking of girls who would only stay very far away from us, when we come back, we're going to do Best Supporting Actress. We are back, and I am just about to tear open this envelope, and it feels so good in my hands. Don't, and I do, can... don't do not do it. What the fuck? What if just I get a little crazy? Tear it right up <laughs> in pieces. We don't even ever know. You know what? Just open on screen duo. And then, like, <laughs> save that for later. That will feel so good. Well, Ryan, before I do something we'll all regret, what, who is our first nominee for Best Supporting Actress? Uh, real quick, a couple of facts about these five ladies. They're all alive. Okay, oh, so okay. no one's going to have the advantage. Right. Uh, your first nominee is the Oscar winner for this year, Kim Basinger from L.A. Confidential. Yeah, I was really impressed with her this, this time around. Uh, I've never loved her as an actress. I've always felt like she kind of has, like, flat effect. But the character kind of does in this, and yeah. so it, she really, like, works it. And there's a lot of subtlety in this role. It's definitely uh, – and it's led by Quentin Tarantino, but a lot of people were doing it, uh, like uh, Moody winner Robert Forster. Um, the late 90s trend of actors who, like, sort of took 10 years off or five yeah. years off because we didn't want to see them anymore – uh, give them a role that really makes them shine. Yeah. Right. And injecting that 10-year absence into that role. Like, right. there's, there's so much of basing her in her character, whose name I forget right now. Uh, Bim Kasinger, I Bim, think it is? Bim. Yeah. There's so Isn't much Kim L- and Bim. Lynn something? Bracken? Lynn Bracken, yes. Yeah. Veronica Lake? Veronica Lake, if you will. Uh, the one thing I will say is, uh, in that white dress, her decolletage is so, like, you just can't stop looking at her chest. Mm-hmm. And it's, like, very disturbing nowadays to be watching a movie and see somebody that tits out. Up yeah. Front. <laughs> Your next yeah. nominee <laughs> is from the film Goodwill Hunting, guys. It's Minnie fucking Driver. She's a, she's a tiny little person who drives a car. Or specifically, she drives a mini. Yeah, she uh, she's in what's that movie? Italian Job. Uh huh. That's the movie. <laughs> is that the Stallone porn? Yeah. Why is she? <laughs> why did the show. board give her supporting not lead? Uh, 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 it's not her story. It's not her story. Okay. Yeah, she she's supporting Will Hunting. Yeah, so I think. some movies just yeah. don't yeah. have. And that's the biggest drawback of a character, yeah. I think. Not her performance, but I, yeah. I think that she is very much made to be like a magical girlfriend mm-hmm. figure. Not that she never gets mad, but when she gets mad, it's like, Will, be the best Will you can be, darn it. Yeah. Uh, so the one knock against her is that because she's written by two young men, she really comes off as a character written by two young men. Yeah. I feel like I would have liked Good Will Hunting as a movie more if it were just a movie about Mini Driver's oh, yeah, character. For Good sure. Mini-driver. Absolutely, yeah. Mike, to what you were saying before, like, yeah, it's not whoever – the girl that has the most screen time isn't bumped to mm-hmm. best actress. Like, it's just about sort of, like, their arc and screen time. And typically that's all that supporting means. It's just that lesser right. than the lead. Yeah. Sometimes it's a little more literal where, like, really all they're doing is, like, sort of blindly supporting uh-huh. the main character. Doing something where she, like, looks at the main character and just goes, you're so smart. <laughs> and he's just like, oh, I don't know. I'm very complicated, too. <laughs> But if you wanted to keep saying that, you totally could. Your next nominee from Jackie Brown, Bridget Fonda. Yeah, you know, I... (laughs) Not going to win, I I, I guess. Yeah, I I feel like that that sums up all of our feelings. I, you know, it's hard because I think her role is meant to be kind of two-dimensional. And so she's just sort of like a bratty layabout. Um, and so there's just not, it doesn't feel like there's as much to do for her as some of the other supporting actress, even Minnie Driver, I feel like is given more depth and dimension than Bridget Fonda. What did you, Surfer Girl? But I think almost sort of barely fits that thing too, of like five years before this, she was like a above the title action star. Yeah. And then sort of just went away and then was plucked from relative obscurity. And she did do that nineties thing with the belly chain. Mm -hmm. Yep. Which I, that, I felt like that really worked. And this time around, I, I realized there's a dynamic to her where she's also supposed to be past her prime. Mm-hmm. They might have picked an actress that more is obviously past her prime, but I, yeah. I feel like I could see that that's what they're going for. And that, I guess, was a little bit of dimension. She's, like, not really surfer girl anymore. She's surfer woman. <laughs> like the Britney Spears song. Like the Britney Spears joint. 
Uh, your next nominee is from Boogie Nights. It's Heather Graham. As Roller Girl. As Roller Girl. <laughs> Friend of Surfer Girl. <laughs> Friend and Bosom Companion. Yeah, adventure Sport Girl Adventures. Uh, th- Heather Graham, I feel like, has such a good... Because she is supposed to be, like, equal in age with Mark Wahlberg in this. But, like, I felt like her performance was so much better than his. Uh-huh. I, th- I, I hope that that's not a controversial <laughs> opinion. Uh, but l- she just brought, like, a, a type of vulnerability and, like, mm-hmm. fuck you itness. Yeah. That was just, like, it felt very, like, a teenager just trying to be an adult. And I think after you watch the entire movie, like... If you're just watch if you're watching it for the first time, you know, in her first couple of scenes, I think are a little false. They're a little like fake and she's trying too hard. But if you watch the entire movie and see who she actually is, it's Roller right. Girl that's trying trying too hard. too hard, right? Totally. Yeah, and I that, that is it's it must be hard to do that as an actor, act like somebody who is putting on a character that hard so that you can confuse the audience into which is which. But yeah, and uh, a lot of vulnerability under that sort of like bravado and big smile. Who is next, Ryan? Also from Boogie Nights, it's Julianne Moore. Yeah, I ro- like this is going to hurt Roller Girl's chances, I think. Yeah. Be in the same movie. Do you think they'll split the boat? Be Julianne Moore. It, if Boogie Nights could almost be Burt Reynolds' movie, it mm-hmm. could also almost be Julianne Moore's movie. Yeah. Like, if, if it were Burt Reynolds' movie, we would be like, this is almost Julianne Moore's movie. <laughs> I mean, is part of the reason uh, Dirk Diggler's performance isn't great is not just because of Mark Wahlberg's like, lack of talent, but everyone surrounding him. Yeah. Like, it is a murderer's row. The only chance he has in this movie is that he basically plays Marky Mark. Mm. Yeah. And so that can be hard to do, but I, I don't I think... I just wanted to be sexy, okay? I just want to be sexy, okay? You guys ready? I'm ready. Let's do it. I'm going to open up the envelope now. That's great. You can really hear it. <laughs> it really carries through. <sighs> Julianne Moore from Boogie Nights. Yeah. yeah that uh, makes sense. Right? Uh, yeah. That that feels right. That feels yeah. like the you, <laughs> correct... <laughs> Is she in the audience right now? Yeah, and she's just (laughs) cheering for herself, which that shows you that even as talented and as successful as she is, she still feels the need to... I think Patreon listeners know that we had a supporting actor bracket for Boogie Nights and the Boogie Nights show, and she steamrolled through that. Yeah. This makes sense. Just dunking on everybody, left or right. When we come back, another matchup. We are back, and we are going to our next battle. And you guys, this is not what they call a slammy D. For round one, battle two, we have Boogie Knights versus Jackie Brown. Oh, great! I'm I'm sorry, bud. Hey, I don't mean to tell you your job, but we're in the first round. We're not at the finals yet. What no. are you doing? Like, yeah. Okay. Did let you me mess up. Let me look again. Sorry, I'll try again. We have Boogie Knights versus Jackie Brown. You said the same thing this time. I just um, said the same and it thing, di- and again. it didn't get any easier. Do you guys feel like this is when the Dodgers played the Nationals in the first round of the uh, Major yes. League Baseball playoffs? Definitely, uh, you took the words from. This is exactly like when the Dodgeballs played the Nationals, <laughs> and just edge of my. It, it's very hard. I don't want to do the thing we're about to do. I think that right there, though, Greg, is a good example of like. Mike thinks that we're cheating because we met each other a long time ago. Uh-huh. All you did was bring up something normal that everyone knows. Yeah. And Mike and Taylor are like, duh, what's that? Sports are dumb. I love High Violet. <laughs> great album, front to back. I think that this is probably the, one of our matchups that fe- features the two greatest directors of any that we've had. Uh, P.T. Barnum versus <laughs> Quentin Tostitos. And uh, the, either one of these movies, right, is probably whoever comes out of this is probably going to win, right? I, I think that's what I would bet on. Yeah, yeah. Um, we can't just do Boogie Nights versus Contact real quick. Like we, <laughs> we can't do it. This is what it, this is why we do a bracket, guys. This is why we're here. This is what Ugh. we want to do. If you could, if I said we're gonna watch a movie right now, what movie would you most want to see? This is not the determination of who the winner is, but what movie would you most want to see? If I said right now, Jackie Brown. Ryan. I'm always down to watch Jackie Brown. You're down for Brown? Okay. Uh, I would. Uh, I'd probably pick Jackie Brown because I have seen Boogie Nights hundreds of times. Yeah. So it's just like lack of familiarity. Taylor, I think I'm going Boogie Nights, but I think it's one of those things where like it depends on what I'm doing that day and what mood I'm in. 
when you ask me. When it comes to what do we just want to watch right now, for me, it's a screaming Jackie Brown. That This feels like the movie, uh, one of these movies that's meant to just be turned on and then just like kind of in the background, right. if not totally paid attention to, because as he made it to be a, a hangout movie, it really is a yeah. hangout movie. And so it like it's their conversations that never get old or boring because they you can like find new depths in them every time you watch them. It, it really is a less try-hard clerks all kevin smith wanted to make early on was hangout movies but he wanted to uh-huh. squeeze every inch of kevin smith into the piece of dialogue and quentin tarantino <laughs> fucking mellowed out for one movie and didn't try to tarantino it up all the goddamn except in the douchebag characters and it's a delight to watch these people just bounce off of each other you guys ever think we'll do a kevin smith episode for movie i would year? love to nope. i have a lot of shit to say I wonder, it's weird because I was just, when you mentioned Kevin Smith, Mike, it made me think like, I can't imagine directors that have fallen as far in my interest. Mm-hmm. Like, I, I, there are people I don't esteem the same way I did as a younger man, but like, I don't even consider Kevin Smith anymore. And like, the, I guess he's got a new movie coming out, the reboot, Jay and, uh, yeah. and it's just like, I couldn't imagine never. bothering I to see never that. see that. Yeah, right? But yeah. like, when Dogma came out, I was like frothing at the mouth mm-hmm. to go watch that movie. And it was not a good movie, you guys. This is like for me with these two movies. Um, I like I, I I sort of am unable to talk intelligently, uh-huh. and I'm just waiting for you to force me to vote and to see like what gets barfed out of my mouth. What has more depth? So it, I, I think we kind of as a group would kind of rather sit down and watch Jackie Brown. But what has more depth? I would say because Jackie Brown is a hangout movie. It it has depth. I, I'm not gonna say it's a shallow movie. Yeah, neither one is. But but it doesn't. I don't think it delves into as deep stuff as Boogie Nights. Boogie Nights. Every moment there is something that it is trying to like dig into and build I, a world around. Yeah, dig I, I think both. Of, well, with these two movies, not only because it's a hard decision, so we're doing everything end to worm our ways out of it. Is they're both dealing with aging and how you age out of your industry. Can you do so gracefully? Do you have to become a corrupt piece of shit to do so? Is only getting yours what's important, or can you become mature and successful and not fuck other people over? And they're doing it in very different ways. Boogie Nights is flashier. I think Jackie Brown, even though it's a hangout movie, is doing a fuck ton, and it's mostly with Greer and Forrester. And Boogie Nights has more sagging moments. Th- There's times where I'm like a little bored in Boogie Nights. And this whole thing about like a hangout movie, like... I think Boogie Nights is the most hangout movie of the eight. Like, there are all of our favorite scenes is when mm-hmm. stuff is That's a good not point. happening, yeah. right? Like, when there's no, there's almost no plot in the movie, it's just watching character A and character B hanging out. Yeah, the only time there is a plot, really, is, like, when they go to <laughs> sell that sell Alfred Molina bad right. drugs. And that's, and that's like, hanging out. Yeah, and it, that's, a, that's the least fun part of the movie. It's too tense. Yeah. And, um, okay, so then... We think Boogie Nights maybe is like the the deeper movie. No, I, and on like when we did the Boogie Nights episode, I thought we sort of like landed on the fact that like Boogie Nights is the best shallow movie of all time. Like, uh-huh. it's, it's greatness is in its shallowness. Um, I I don't remember that at all coming from that conversation. It came from this conversation though. <laughs> I did just I say don't. it. I remember that part. Do you remember that? that? I, I do remember, remember that. Yeah. That uh, I think that you have to dig a little harder to find stuff. In Boogie Nights. I think it has less to say. I'm not saying that's the ultimate I, determiner I, either. I so disagree with you. Then Jackie Brown. Not that it has nothing to say, but just then Jackie Brown. I, I think Jackie Brown has a lot to say. I feel like Boogie Nights has so much to say. And I've watched it more than Jackie Brown. And I still have, I feel, more questions about what Boogie Nights is saying than Jackie Brown. I feel like I get the point of Jackie Brown. There's a lot of depth to it. And I can think about it for a long time. But I feel like I find new things every single time I think about Boogie Nights. You know, one thing to me that is maybe a strike against Boogie Nights is it has a happy beginning and a very terrible like middle section. But then is the ending too happy, too cheery? Yeah, I mean, we start from innocence and we uh, end in innocence with this movie. I, I, I don't think so because I think the – the sort of bittersweet ending is that like everyone else sort of gets something else outside of porn. Dirk Diggler, our main character, he has to just accept like 
this is the only thing that I'm good at, and if I'm not doing this, <laughs> that's pretty crazy. Then my entire yeah. world it will fall apart. Yeah, like I am yeah, only good as long as this on dick purpose because these are kind of <laughs> shallow people. And the end of the movie is like sometimes to be to not want to kill yourself, you have to embrace that vapidity. Like, yeah, party all the time. Otherwise, you're gonna slit your wrist. But on the flip side, like sort of the point of the movie is that uh, you can't judge people in this industry and think that they're all two dimensional people. Mm. Look how three dimensional they are. Yeah, you know, like he's trying to show that like porn is not everything that they are, except for maybe Dirk Diggler. Yeah, yeah. But see, Cause which is because- and, and I mean that like, do you guys know what the uh, the what movie that ending is ripping off? No. It's like it's Raging Bull. It's uh, yeah, it's, yeah. It's Robert De Niro thinking like all I am is this fucking mook. This is all I'm good for, yeah. even though all the other characters sort of like move on. But see, okay, at the end of Raging Bull though, he does have that stage show and it's kind of successful and he seems to legit like doing it, right? Like I mean, he's he he hosts this show and everybody comes to see him and I I feel like at the end of that movie, that's not shown to be a pathetic thing. There are times where he seems ridiculous for doing it. But at the end, it seems like he's kind of found some amount of peace with that. And I would say the same thing with Boogie Nights. Dirk Diggler, at the beginning of the movie, he really only is fucking. But there's an innocence and a beauty to that because he still cares about doing it in a good way. What happens is he goes and he gets involved in drugs. That's really yeah. like the, the evil part of this movie. Well, that's because during that like very intense scene where like everyone is hitting their lowest moments, everyone else is encountering issues because they are in porn. Dirk Diggler is encountering issues because he's not doing. Yeah, because he's moved away from porn. Yeah, like he's the only one who encounters like the his lowest moment because he's not fucking on camera. I have to call for Ugh. a vote, gentlemen. And so we're going to put one of these movies to bed. I hope our show has done justice to it. And one of these right. movies no one in the world can ever watch again. No, yeah, it's being retired. Right this, it will be taken off Netflix should it be on Netflix. It will be taken off Disney Plus should it appear on Disney Plus. It it's, will be removed from the canon and shot via canon into space. It's going in the Your Pop Filter vault. I, Mike, I let's go I to am. you first since you're raring to be the first vote. are two of the best movies we've watched in, out of all the seasons of movie of the year, but I fucking hate Boogie Nights. But which one do Fuck you hate? Fuck everybody who likes it at all. Jackie Brown takes the crown. <sighs> Woo! That was very brave, Ryan. Can you be as brave? Yeah, I'm going Jackie Brown. I think it's just I think it's the more mature movie that like handles its themes better. I guess. And Taylor, you would have what your vote no longer matters. Yeah, I know, but uh, because I'm just always interested in your opinion, like what's up with you? I, how I, would you have voted? I think because I'm the young gun of the group, uh-huh. I would have voted for Boogie Nights. Yeah, you're kind of our Dirk Diggler. Yeah, it's it's all about <laughs> a, a young dumb idiot who has a really good dick. So I I respond yeah. to that very strongly. Is it wrong for us to assume that you are strapped? No, you know what? I'm I plead the fifth. <laughs> He'll never tell. <laughs> I assume that Taylor is hung because of that phrase. God has to at least give with one hand, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, if Cassie was here hosting the show, Greg. Um, Wait, what? Just, I'm just hypothetically. Relax. Oh, my God. If Cassie from A Natural 20s was here. I'm freaking out. I am freaking out. And uh, so there was five. Do you know what you would go with? I would have said Jackie Brown as well. Uh, I like Boogie Nights. It's a very, very good movie. It could win against any other movie probably in this bracket. But when I stack it up against Jackie Brown, I feel like it's clear to me, and I, I don't even really have to, to to consider it that much. I enjoy yeah. watching it more. I think it's more subtle about where the depth is to it. Um, it's so enjoyable. It's about, like, it's in a lot of ways about film, which I guess Boogie Nights is as well. But, like, I just love the way ten- Tarantino talks about movies, even in movies that aren't about movies, yeah. you know? And, and when I vote for Boogie Nights, it is with, like, if Bo- if Boogie Nights is like a nine point five for me, yeah. Jackie Brown is like a nine point four. Like uh, like I am absolutely happy to see Jackie Brown move on. As opposed to what we're about to do later on in this episode, which is if movie A is a five for me, then movie B is like a four point yeah. five. Like this yeah. is a bummer first round matchup. It's but it's why we do it too, right? Yeah. Like we're trying to force ourselves to have to make these uncomfortable decisions. Like like if these were the final, I feel like I would feel just as good. And th- this makes PTA over two. Wow. Magnolia and Boogie Nights. But I hope we don't bump into him because it's, it's going to be, be awkward, so dude. awkward. Also, I wouldn't recognize him, so I wouldn't even know until it was over. <laughs> I then. weirdly know exactly what he looks group. like. I've okay, seen well, so many pictures. Of he the guy like, oh, shit, there's just some unassuming looking guy. We need to run because he's going to have some stuff to say. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we got to get out of here, pod boys. Let's go. I love your work with Heim. 
When we come back, we are going to give out the award for best on-screen duo. Is it me and Taylor? Oh! Stay tuned. Find out. Now, guys, good things, I have heard, come in twos. So we're going to give out two awards right now to the best on-screen duo. This is good because we just had, uh, it was really hard because we had to make one thing a loser. Mm -hmm. And now we have to make four things a loser. Uh, Ryan, I only got the one envelope here. Uh Uh-huh. Should I have another envelope? For each of the duo? For each one part of the duo? Do you want me to hand you another envelope? I just like opening them up so much, you guys. I I gotta say, it's really fun. Uh, I also like watching uh, Taylor stare at the envelopes, hoping that he will get a chance, and it's just not gonna happen, but like... (laughs) No. Look at the... Look at the... Greg's eyes right now. I'm holding them, even in the segments where we're talking about the battles. (laughs) I'm just holding the envelopes the entire time. Uh, behind the curtain? That's true. Yeah. <laughs> you've, you've got a real grasp on those things. <laughs> yeah. You use them emphatically to make points. You kind of slap us in the face <laughs> when That's you're talking true. at us. That's my thing. People love me for that. You guys want to talk about a movie that we have not talked about yet? Sure. Okay. Mm-hmm. From Princess Mononoke, Ashitaka and San, okay. who I think is also known as Princess Mononoke. Yeah, she's, she's the wolf girl. She's the wolf girl. And he's the demon boy. Yes. She's a wolf girl wolf standing girl in front demon of a boy. demon boy, asking <laughs> him to love her. Asking him to support the forest in its war against man. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I mean, that's a thing that I've heard countless times from women. Their relationship has a lot of depth and is part of what is uh, kind of hard to fully grasp about this movie. Yeah. This movie is not about a conflict that where it's so obvious what side mm-hmm. you're supposed to take. And uh, the isn't... She, the time we first see her, she is wiping blood. Oh, the best oh, meet yeah. cute yeah. in movie history. <laughs> oh, man. He sees her, like, in, you know, like, from behind the trees in, like, this forest. It's beautiful. And she is sucking out of a wolf's bullet <laughs> hole and then wiping the blood on her face. Yeah. That is so kick. Listen, fellas, if you, ever, if you ever meet a lady in a wooded stream and yeah. she's sucking the blood out of a bullet wound from a wolf, say hey. You know what? See what's going on. Wife her right up. Yeah. Even if she's wearing headphones and trying to read. Go no. interrupt her. <laughs> that to blood on the face is a clear sign she wants to be talked to, no matter what else she's doing at the time. <laughs> she wouldn't do that for her. No. I, no matter how her wolf reacts. They're very interesting together, and the movie is great. But I put them up with Rose and Leo of, there's no chemistry here. They're together because the movie needs them to be romantically interested. And and I don't even know if, the, I don't, are they fully even supposed to be romantically interested? I mean, there seems like a very yes. brief time where they consider romance, but then they decide to, that they have, they essentially have to live apart. And this is yeah. not best couple. This is just mm-hmm. best duo. Duo. So yeah. like, it doesn't have to be romance, but like my favorite part of them in the movie is at the end, they're like, well, story's over. Should we date? And we're like, yeah, but like, we're still going to live in our separate world. Yeah. Bye. Yeah. And then they just See separate. They're, they're keeping it casual. Yeah. It's a very 2019 attitude. <laughs> Who is next, Ryan? It's Caster Troy and Sean Archer from the film Face Off. Now, oh, boy. I know that they are not boyfriend and boyfriend, mm-hmm. but there's a real energy here, you guys. They're, they probably yes. have more chemistry than most of the other duos on this They list. live inside of each other's bodies. <laughs> yeah, for sure, So much dude. of the violence would probably stop if they ju- did just rail. Like, they would both realize maybe just- they should leave their jobs and lovers and just be together somewhere in Tahiti. And imagine them oh, fucking while they've each yeah. got the other guy's face. Oh, my dream? <laughs> Living my dream? <laughs> call, call me by your name, am I right? <laughs> uh, I just started watching that Paul Rudd Netflix show. Yeah. And I can't stop thinking how I would totally bang myself if I was in that situation. Oh, yeah. The, I mean, there are two types of people in this world. People who would bang themselves if they met their clone and people who are wrong. Well, okay. Here's my thing with that show. Are they going to team up on that wife or what, dude? If if you are married to somebody and there is suddenly a clone of you, you owe it to your partner for you and the clone to go to town on your spouse. Yeah. I just think that's a basic I think I think that was I my mean, vow. I mean, obviously like clear yes. it with them first, be like, Are you cool with there being two of me? But I mean, I can't imagine there'd be anyone who would say no. As a general rule, I clear anything I'm gonna do that's... with someone sexually. <laughs> I don't let that I don't let you. that sneak up on them. But I think Thank you, Mike. I just wanted to put that out there. I, well, the, the specific thing I'm clearing is like, hey, don't like pictures like, hey, you want to have a threesome, no. and then there are two no, U's. Yeah, you no. should disclose that the fact that there are First two off, U's ahead of time. is real. No, well. Secondly. <laughs> yeah, I got a couple things to tell you. So that's not one of those, it's easier to apologize, yeah. no, like, ask yeah. forgiveness than permission? Oh, yeah, by the way, the other dude in this threesome is also me. Okay, I'll bring him in. Quick, quick and, info dump for you. I just like her face. <laughs> 
Cool. Like, <laughs> so this is a great reason. duo, right? Uh, your next nominees. And by the way, like these are for characters that are getting these noms. But I sort of, for that one, almost want to say uh, John and Nicholas as opposed yeah. to, like, they, the two of them are just having a lot of fun. From Boogie Nights, it's Dirk Diggler and Reed Rothschild. That, yeah. is, a, that is a very, this is the type of friendship that I oh, want buddy. to have in my life. Uh-huh. Where you just show up, you, you show up, you tell them a thing that you do, and they go, I, I can do it slightly better. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> just instantaneously. But in real life, all those conversations are awful. They make it. Perfect. Like yeah. th- they're like in harmony. This is one of two movies that features characters meeting each other and instantly talking about how much they can lift. Yes, and it has the same thing where it's like, well, how, wait, how much do you lift? Okay, never mind. Yeah, I don't want to talk about it anymore. Well, no, uh, you say first, and then I'll and then I'll we'll say, say it at the same time. We'll say it at the same time. You didn't say it. Somebody and say, what do you do for a living? So the only interesting thing you can ask them is, how much do you lift? And now you actually know what their soul. What is. do you bench? Are are we That's all true. supposed to know how much we can do on different lifts? I I know how much you can do on yeah right because yeah. you, you go to yeah. the mic you probably know how like, much you can do on different probably twenty five right? bucks is my top my top lift from point A to point B. <laughs> Good joke. I uh, I don't know how much I can lift. I would like you guys to guess. Well, I see. I couldn't guess if you if you don't lift. I don't think you have any idea how much you can no. do or not. I assume I'm very weak. Is it like is it less than four hundred? Is it right about four hundred pounds? You probably you could bench four hundred. I'm I'm guessing you'd squat about fourteen hundred. <laughs> Sweet. Yeah, <laughs> that's my best friend. What can I say, you guys? Sweet, sweet no, I gotta support him in everything I do. I did recently watch a video of a dude deadlifting eleven hundred pounds. Yeah, and it almost it almost broke his body. Yeah, like the, they were like, he, uh, he can't remember the names of anyone for two weeks after this. There's and well, the, like he broke part of his brain. That's where your that that's where the the structural integrity of your skeleton starts coming into it. Yeah, like fuck your muscles and tendons, dude. Like, can your bones hold this much shit? Like, he had to wear a, a very specially made suit so that his body wouldn't just explode from the stress. Also, it's my favorite sport because, like, in basketball. You're like you have the game winning shot. Your face just like yes. Baseball yes. Yeah. And w- lifting <laughs> like when you do that lift, it's like oh fuck, fuck, fuck. Oh, yeah, gosh, dude. I did it. I did it. But for two seconds, your face is crazy. Plus, I imagine it's all like when you have a baby, you just shit every time. <laughs> <laughs> every time they do one of those lifts, they just fall well. That's up. what the squat is. Right? Yeah. All right, Ryan. Who else? <laughs> oh yeah. Um, from Jackie Brown, it's Jackie and Max. Oh, oh yes. fuck, dude. Should I just tear this bad boy so open just, right now, yeah, dude? Just chemistry out the like, fucking wall, Good dude. night, Irene, on this one. Oh, give me some of them Odell. I mean, we probably have our best supporting actor and potentially our best actress, our best lead actress. Together here. Together, dude. I mean, and you feel it. They really feel like two people together without it like having the artifice of, of movie all over their scene. I think that there's not enough of us who love Princess Mononoke. There's not enough of us who love Face Off. But Dirk and Reed, I think, is that would be the big contender. For yeah. Me. Yeah. And then it's uh, K and J from Men in Black. You know what? Their chemistry is great. Honestly, I lo- that's love one, this duo. one of the best parts of the movie is, mm-hmm. the, is yeah. the two. They both singly do a good job, but together, they, they're very effective. So I want to act like I'm better than Men in Black, but this is the best part of Men in Black. It, it, right. Men in Black makes me wish that Will oh, Smith shit, was at least awesome. a little bit in No Country for Old Men. <laughs> As Anton Chigurh? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Should I tear this bad boy open? Let's do it. Now opening the envelope with ease. I'm making it look like I do this every day, and I do. I'm really good at opening things. I'm really good at reading things, and right now I'm just focusing on opening. But you know what? I'm going to move right on to the reading phase right now. And yeah, it's Jackie Max from Jackie. Yeah, of course, yeah. From Jackie Brown. Yeah, we all knew. Yeah. yeah. As soon as I heard that, I was like, oh, yeah, this is the one. So it's already made it out of round one uh, and taken the- down two Moody's. Yep. Have yep. we uh, seen a pattern here? Uh, uh, maybe. And all this stuff uh, is, by the way, surprising nobody. Mm-hmm. As yeah. soon as we started talking about this season, this is exactly what we all said was going to happen. Yeah. Probably because the season started a short time after Once Upon a Time in Hollywood came out. And for whatever reason, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood started up a lot of chatter about Jackie Brown. Uh, and, yeah, so I think we are primed to just keep talking about how much we love Jackie Brown. But we can't do that. Until we go to our next matchup and start yelling right in each other's faces. We are moving on to round one, battle three. And our matchup is Goodwill Hunting versus Contact. Now, I have mentioned it a lot on this show, but I think it is worth mentioning. Contact is the lowest ranked show we have ever had. 
or not the lowest ranked show, the lowest ranked movie we've ever had. So this was a 22 seed, um, and plucky little movie, fight, fight, fighting, pushed its way right on up to fight with the fight with the top dogs. Now, yeah, you're with the big dogs now, and you're going up against Goodwill Hunting. One of these movies is going to move on farther <laughs> than Boogie Nights. That's insane. This is, this is this is how we've made Brackets. it for ourselves. That, this is how it goes. I would say that this is sort of as hard as the last one, just in a, in different, a different way. way in, right? a, in a different way. I I think that I have a clearer winner in my mind. So I would like to talk about Goodwill Hunting. <laughs> Let's chat about Goodwill Hunting. It, this Goodwill Hunting to me is a movie. That it's a hangout movie. It's it, yet another one. It is yet another hangout movie. But I feel like I, I could see how it could get a lot of buzz and attention when it came out. Yes. Now watching it, it is very obviously a movie written by like two like young twenty something year olds uh-huh. who have not really experienced a whole lot. And have this idea of, like, what if I was, like... Including a scene in which they have an older character say to the younger character, you really haven't experienced a lot. You know a lot about things, but you don't know a lot about the world. Uh, And it it really comes across as, like, a a fantasy of what if we were, like, young, dumb kids, but also one of us was, like, a super genius. And Uh we could tell everyone to fuck off. (laughs) Yeah, a, a more mature movie would interrogate Will... And talk about his flaws a little more than the current actual incarnation his, of Goodwill Hunting does. Instead, his he's main flaw is he's hero. kind of a badass. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. He's, sorry, he loves fighting. Cool. The prequel. You know what it Jason actually reminds Warren. me of? We were talking about him earlier, and the person I'm about to mention has a lot of uh, intertwining with Goodwill Hunting. Is like early Kevin Smith movies. Uh, pretty good at the banter. Thinks he's good at like the philosophy and the yeah. human experience. But anytime it like treads toward that, it's like, oh, it, no, because like yeah. we're just supposed to like sort of get it on the side subliminally, as opposed yeah. to people straight up saying to the camera all the things the writer and director thinks. And how wise can you really be when you're like 26 years old? Yeah. The first time I saw this, I was like 15, so I was like, damn, yeah, best Whoa. movie ever. Yeah. And yeah. The, these guys really see through the veil. I like but, those apples. But like the most the movie ever like <laughs> really interrogates Will. This is like, hey. You should really like lean into how good of a person you are. <laughs> You're so good, and you just like don't quite see how great you are. Also, the movie never deals with the fact that probably all those characters are racists. Yeah, they're, they're right. in Boston. Oh, yeah. yeah, they live in Boston, I home do, of northern racism. I am not sure that there's a minority extra anywhere no. in the movie. <laughs> no, that's one of those movies where you can really go and scour each shot. But it completely reimagines the world as like almost exclusively a white only space. Yeah, it, it is. It is like a a white utopia. Like the most oppressed you can be is a slightly less rich white person. Now I should mention that is also the way um, the two thousand four movie of the year, Eternal Eternal Sunshine is with yeah. Brooklyn. Mm-hmm. It is a Brooklyn of only white people. So. <laughs> there is precedent on this show for just accepting that. that I guess we're into it. Like <laughs> history dictates that we like. I guess this has to move. Movie on. of the year. We're part of the problem. Um, I don't think that. Like, I don't. I'm not sure that I know who's going to win this. So, getting to contact real quick. Um, we were very stoked to yeah. take that 22 seed to the top eight. And After, we were like contact for life yeah. before we watched it. We got Which, tattoos. We yeah, talked to Jodie Foster. I, having, I think, seen the movie more recently than everyone else, I was a little confused by that, by and that you, muster. You know what? That should that should have meant something to us because before you had seen it recently, you were probably like contact ride or die, right? I mean, yeah. Or Gattaca or whatever the fuck movie. Or yeah, whatever about. movie yeah. he's seen recently. Who knows what movie Taylor thinks he's talking about. But uh, did you guys after – I mean, like when we did it on the show, we were pretty positive. Yeah, but, yeah. Like, we did sort of lose that fervor yeah. once we actually watched yes, the movie. I, I feel I feel like everyone sort of walked back their extreme positive. I still really like the movie Contact. Yeah, it's just that disparity between how excited we were to watch mm-hmm. it and then afterwards being like, yeah, solid. Yeah. Well, because it's all, all, only the good stays in your brain, and then when you watch it, you remember Palmer Joss as a character. Yeah. yeah. And so that really weighs down the rest of the movie. Also, when we do these movies from years where I was a teenager – I have very clear memories of my feelings about all of them. And they're all like what you think as a young person. And then, so then when I hear the movie, I'm like, yeah, awesome. Broken arrow or whatever. <laughs> like, but then you watch it as an adult and you're like, oh, this is dumb. And contact's not, well, no, contact is dumb. 
That that's what it is. It's dumb. I mean, I would say that like if it wasn't for Palmer Joss, like Palmer Joss is a poorly written Ben and Matt character. Uh-huh. Like mm-hmm. he's closer to that movie than Contact. If we took him out. I, it, the movie, I think, is way, way better. All the yes. stuff, I find all the stuff about God, the fact that they talk so openly about what alien life means about God and the fact that it becomes part of, like, governmental procedures, that was the part that really lost me this time around because it's not that God isn't important, but if you make a movie like this and it, it's, it wants to talk about faith and what it means in our, our place in the universe if there's other beings, I think you do it more subtly mm-hmm. and less like where there's like government hearings where people are like, can we send a godless man to space? So, like, <laughs> or th- even worse, a godless woman? <gasps> that sort of makes me think, though, that like, it, it belongs on the Shawshank list. Like, it's sort of a great movie for dumb people uh-huh. yeah. because of how obvious it is about like God versus science and all that stuff. Yeah. I mean, it is obvious, but I do think that that is a thing that like should be brought up in more mo- like faith is like a weird still like a weird big deal like the fact that like people said obama wasn't fully a christian was like a huge deal for a ton of people and like you can't lead a country if you're not a christian like that is still a big deal that what a quaint notion we used to have yeah right because now like we're like you can you can only run this country if you're the worst person it's ever produced. If Which, you are the absolute worst person and stupidest idiot, that's honestly, the only thing you I'm can be- so excited for Carolyn Callaway to run the country. <laughs> that's the only way we can trust you. All your gross cards are on the table because you're a yeah. piece of shit. Sure, run the country. Oh man, I feel I feel bad. I feel awful. <laughs> All right. The only thing that can usually get me over the dark night of the soul is when we vote on which movie yeah. is going to proceed. Did we just reveal to everyone why we do the podcast? <laughs> <laughs> Take us away from they real know. life, please. They so, know. what is it going to be, T-Money? Is it Goodwill Hunting or is it Contact? I think, for me, it's just barely Contact. Yeah, like closer than you expected, but it is Contact. Yeah. I, I like. I think Goodwill Hunting has a lot of good parts, but it just. I think the base message of the movie to me is bad. <laughs> All right, Ryan. I think when it's this close and a matchup that is sort of stupid, I think I am going to sort of go with the '97 of it all. Yeah, that's and, a great a great time to use that. And I think I am going to go with Goodwill Hunting. Okay, a much '97 era movie than than Contact. All right, Mike. That makes you the deciding vote. I didn't plan it that way, but I feel yeah, pretty good it's, about it's it. Yeah, it's bananas how '97 Goodwill Hunting in and that it's still talked about. And Contact is not. Contact is one of the most forgotten movies we've done, which is kind of bananas. Uh, but I think. To cut the ballast of Palmer Joss would elevate contact so much, and you would have to <laughs> surgically remove so much of Goodwill Hunting to make it a better movie. My vote has to be for contact. Oh, shit. Wow. I, guys, that was a 22 seed. 22 I ran, seed, the, in, baby. I ran seed. the entire gamut of emotions there. I was like, okay, it's looking like contact's not going to move on. That, that, that's okay. And then it did. I would have been a contact vote. Um, I, I've got that contact high. Uh, I agree that it's not as good as I remember it. But Goodwill Hunting, I just, I don't know. I just had, like, almost no feeling towards at all. Like, I, I just didn't care. I wanted it to be over so bad <laughs> the entire time. Except for when Mini Driver was on the screen. Yeah. All right, when we come back, we are going to give the award for Best Hangout? Hanging out. It's what separates us from the animals, except for those animals that hang out, which is actually quite a lot of them now that I think about it. Friendship. It's what, no. Uh, Deciding what separates us from the animals. It's what separates us from the animals. Animals ain't doing that shit. No, dude, they're just like, we. I'm a mongoose. I'm one of the animals, for yeah, sure. I'm <laughs> Like I'm right in the middle it. of what the animals are. I'm always Ricky Ticky Tavian <laughs> all over the place. <laughs> but when animals are hanging out, they like to think about the greatest hangout duo. Or not what is it? This is a character you want to hang out with. My favorite thing in the world is uh, Greg how Greg randomly starts a segment and then just has to keep going. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, what a, what am I even talking about? What? So steer to the curve. This is character you most want to hang out with. And this is gonna be an animal, Ryan? I think so, yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, so we had hundreds of options for this. Yeah. Uh, we narrowed it down to these are the five that we would want to. And then we're going to decide one character that is going to like maybe be on the podcast someday. We're going to go to like TGI Fridays with. Even though it's a fictional person. Well, we'll see. Slash animal. Okay. Ryan, start reading the contestants. Your first nominee is the mongoose. <laughs> Just in general. <laughs> He's going to win. He's going to win, you guys. Your, first, your second excuse me, nominee of six is uh, Beaumont Livingston. 
Chris Tucker from Jackie Brown. Wow. wow. Guys, <laughs> what are we doing here? <laughs> well, um, uh, can the people who voted on this be so shocked by the results? <laughs> well, uh, I, I, was there I, a mistake? Beaumont seems like a fine guy. Like, yeah. he's, he's, he's pretty this is cool. The guy, he's kind of funny. This is the guy who gets out of jail, which kind of is like the precipitating event for all of Jackie Brown. But all we see of him is standing in a doorway being like, uh, I don't want to come out, and Samuel L. Jackson being like, well, come on out. I'm not going to kill you. Wink, wink. Oh, I get it. I understand. Yeah. Mike, what? I mean, that's – I can really relate to Beaumont because I never want to go hang out with anybody. So I think that's why I'd want to hang out with him because we would be like, let's hang out. No, let's both just stay at our separate apartments. And, like, he – like, this is what we fear. We don't want to hang out because we think if we leave our apartment or our home, uh-huh. we're going to get fucking shot in a truck. Uh-huh. So we're yeah, just going to stay at home. Come. Ryan, do me a favor. What is the name of the character played by Samuel L. Jackson in this movie? Ordell Ordell Beckham Jr. Was there confusion about which character this was from Jackie Brown, do you think? Oh, maybe. <laughs> like what like because Max Cherry is the bail bondsman. Yeah. Uh, Jackie uh, Brown is that one girl. What are the what are the names of the cops? Did people think that this was a different person? I no? uh, maybe you know what? I just want to hang out with Chris Decker. I think in okay in ninety seven, yeah. all anybody wanted was to hang out with Chris yeah. Tucker, even if he couldn't understand the words that were coming out of your mouth. I just I, I would want to touch his radio, but I would not be allowed to. No, you wouldn't. We didn't know that before. We know that now. Right. Your next nominee is Buck Swope from Boogie Nights. Fuck yes. Okay, you guys. When he shows up to that party and he's in like the Earth, Wind, and Fire getup. Yeah. Oh my god. Now hold on, like. He earned this. Don Cheadle's great. The character's great, but he earned this nomination because of how sad he was at the party, right? Yes. Yeah. I, 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 and everything that he does, like when he's putting in a, an eight track of country western music, they're gonna like, now what you really want is this modification. So you, you hear the that bass. high end? You hear <laughs> that high end? You're not gonna get that if you don't have the modification. I want to hang out with that dude all the fucking time. But does Buck I just want to fun. Isn't he a very yes. self serious guy? Uh, I want to hear him talk to me about how con- like country fashion is coming back. He obviously does that so much that it wears out the other characters in the movie. But honestly, I want to hear his whole pitch. <laughs> yes. And, and here's the thing. I, f- I feel like he is very serious, but he's so like genuinely passionate about the things that he cares about. And he wants to talk about them. And that's all I care about in a person. Yeah. Like, don't be fake. Just be very genuine and happy. I'm sort of seeing our, like the four of our dynamic right now. Like If we were all Boogie Nights characters, that I would be Dirk Diggler, Taylor your Buck Swope. Mike is Philip Seymour Hoffman and Greg is Philip Seymour Hoffman, right? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) That makes sense. Your next nominee is from Titanic. It's the one. It's the only. Yes, guys. Fabrizio got a nomination. (laughs) Now, this is not a mistake. Listen, people people heard Beaumont Livingston. They're like, that small character? Yeah. Fabrizio had like no screen time, but every moment he was on, he was a fucking shining star. There's clearly a cut of this movie that has like a whole plot about Leonardo DiCaprio's character and Fabrizio like having a friendship and I, ma- I imagine at some point Fabrizio's like I never see you anymore because now you're hanging out with this girl yeah. like I don't like we're, we're drifting apart but that's how the beginning of the movie plays out and then he disappears and then right at the end of the movie it's like Fabrizio <laughs> what? Yeah, what you mean? all over the fucking Titanic there's a lot of <laughs> chicks to plow through for Fabrizio I'll- I'll tell you what, I think they named his character Fabrizio because he is a breath of fresh air in this <laughs> yeah. yeah, dude. Every couch he sits on, he's leaving it cleaner than it was before, right? Or at least yes. smelling nicer. Uh, we, for whatever reason, I don't know if everybody watching Titanic always attaches themselves to Fabrizio, but this podcast, we all are just like, that was like mostly what we talked yeah. about on that show. Like independently, we all came in and at the moment one person mentioned Fabrizio, I was like, okay, so I'm glad <laughs> yeah, you brought good. this up. Thank you for, <laughs> thank you for saying Fabrizio that. Fabrizio is my best friend and he's my best little boy. Next week in the finals, do you think Jackie Brown will be taken down <laughs> by Fabrizio yeah. as movie of the year? <laughs> Fabrizio, the Titanic story? Your next nominee... Your next nominee is uh, No Glove, No Love himself from Goodwill Hunting. It no. is Morgan. Nope. Do you guys already hang out with Morgan? Yeah, have you met Taylor? <laughs> I, I, somehow I knew that was coming. How did, th- how did he do this? How, why is he so. What's going on? Yeah, why is he so. High? He's awful. Payola? Yeah. I mean, like, <laughs> this is a Harvey Weinstein movie, so uh-huh. he probably did his, like, typical stuff to get nominated. He, he came in a glove and then dumped it in a, in a pl- potted plant. I guess we did talk about the baseball glove thing a lot. I feel like that made a big impression. And, and he everybody. is kind of aroused about it. He's a, he's, a, <laughs> he's, a, 
He's he's a he's, he's a, a bit of a ne'er do well. Yeah, he, he's a guy. He he he's always uh looking for looking for jobs, getting into scrapes. Uh huh. I like that in a guy. He's a, he's a fun little scrappy guy to have around. You know what he is too is like uh, the thing that we're always looking for is mm-hmm. a Jerry from Parks and Rec. Uh-huh. So that right. means that we aren't the Jerry. Yeah. Oh, so yeah. we could just like it's shit so on nice him to all day long. That would be fun. Even they know they're the piece of shit. That they can't really fight back. They'll try because oh, yeah. they know that's their role. Because nobody wants a Jerry who's like, I'm Jerry, please throw more shit at me. And it seems but so they fre- mostly settle into it and they mostly just accept it. Yeah. <laughs> it seems so freeing. Like, if we're all in a, like, in a house, I, I can't go upstairs and fuck a glove because I don't want you guys to think I'm that kind of person. Yeah. If you're already the Jerry, just go do if it. Go in. fuck yeah. a glove. Your final nominee. And uh, typically I don't bring up how the votes go, but I do want to bring up the fact that uh, on many ballots... This was high, and Greg, this was very low for you. Okay. So I want to talk about this. Your final nominee of people you want to hang out with the most is the Kodoma <laughs> from Princess Mononoke. The, the little white butt boys who have yeah. rotating phone heads. You guys all wanted to hang out with them? <laughs> Absolutely. 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 100%. Oh, I don't like the – okay, these things are not evil or bad. They're kind of that Princess Mononoke, like they're spirits, so they yeah. do spirit stuff, and, and it's hard to, for me to say whether it's good or bad. They do it in their own way. But – there's that kind of creeps me out, and second, they are just very creepy. No, they're they're, they're very very creepy. They're so cute. Look at their, their faces; like keep like twisting back. No, yeah. Look at look at their cute little butts yeah. and their faces it's who do butts, not know right? time. Okay. <laughs> they have adorable little tushies. I'm not saying they don't. Oh. They've got a, they've got adorable little tushies and faces that are ageless and timeless. They yeah. they exist beyond reason. I, honestly, this Greg, you just don't want to experience not having the cutest butt in the room. <laughs> it's the first time for you. <laughs> All of Studio Ghibli has taught me that, like, I like these movies that have, like, spirits in them, but I would never want to experience even a moment with with, with one of these spirits. They're just so – they're, they're, they're mm-hmm. portrayed as so other than human, like, on a completely different yeah, scale. Their just faces are only faces so in the way that we recognize that even, like – Electric plugs have faces. <laughs> like it's They're just above two the butt. dots here. A yeah, dot exactly. Here, a mouth. Like, and the movie does that too. Like Ashitaka is just down with everybody, but yeah. like the two guys that he's with in the beginning <laughs> when they meet the Kadoma, they're like, "What the fuck? Get us out of here! This is insane." <laughs> <laughs> they're sort of like, "This is some like jigsaw fucking saw shit." I do not want this. Yeah. <laughs> take this Annabelle ass like weird spirit away from me. Okay, but if you found out the jigsaw. Was a Kodomo the entire time? That movie's way more yes. adorable. Are we ready? I'm ready. Long okay. Goose. Here we Long go. Mongoose. <laughs> From the movie My Adventures with Mongoose. <laughs> My Dinner with Mongoose. <laughs> It's Buckswell from Boogie yeah! Nights! Yeah! I think we fun. all agree with this. I think so. So uh, so far we have two awards for Boogie Nights, two awards for Jackie Brown, and they fought each other in the first round. <laughs> cool. Very cool. And you know what? If uh, Buckswell can't show up because he doesn't exist and so it just That's has cool. to be Don Cheadle, we'll make do. Yeah, that, yeah. that'll be fine. We will just absolutely... <laughs> I'll talk to him so <laughs> much about you. House of Lies. Make do. When we come back... Our last matchup of the first round. The last match of this first round is Princess Mononoke versus Men in Black. Who wants to say some nice stuff about Men in Black? <sighs> High art so comes in so many forms. In, in many ways, it is the perfect compliment to Princess Mononoke. Hold on, are we declaring this a slam dunk? This is this this is yeah the, uh, is, the with the power is, of a thousand suns yeah this is so much a slam this dunk this is king of the dunks uh, I, listen Will Smith is great <laughs> it it deals a lot with the protection of roaches yeah in, in which I think is a thing that still to this day we haven't really reckoned with as as a culture it uh it for a whole bunch of the movie it seems like we're gonna we're gonna have like a frank conversation about immigration yeah <laughs> it, it, that, and more importantly like immigrant rights that like that conversation is always just like fluttering just off screen yeah like at any moment you could like deliver even just deliver a line slightly differently and we'd be having that conversation. Uh, re- regardless of what you think about him now or the last batch of movies he's been in, this is like peak Will Smith. Oh, yeah. And if anything, uh, he's like acting beside Tommy Lee Jones or like Tommy Lee Jones is even doing a better job than that. They almost won Best Duo. Yeah, I think there's there's so many things that this is an enjoyable ass movie. If you want. Yeah, okay, good. Thank you. I was going to say, you're, 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 you're guys is, you're doing that, you're 
words are compliments, but your tone is condescending. And this is a yeah, fucking is, fun time at the movies. I, I, yeah, I didn't mean to be condescending. I meant like there's a. I meant to point out a lot of things that are very solid about this movie. It's just not the type of movie that like gets to win these matchups generally. And Princess Mononoke, all these Studio Ghibli movies, you could watch them a thousand times and yeah. still not totally be sure why everything happens or what everything means. It like it eludes full understanding and that's always the movies that win in our bracket. Yeah. Like I yesterday was like driving somewhere and just thinking about Princess Mononoke. Yeah. And I stopped thinking about Men in Black the moment that we, I was finished watching it. I enjoyed the entire time that I watched it. Yeah. But it's not the one that I have to put a lot of thought into. Here's the thing. If we are going to if we were to think about this Roger Ebert style, um I think that Men in Black had its bar and shot 20 feet over it. Uh-huh. And I think Princess Mononoke's bar, which, although admittedly, like, way higher than Men in Black's bar, I, I think a little bit of Mononoke touched the bar as it came over. Yeah. Bar didn't fall down. Like, it still cleared it. But, like, a little bit of, like, gut hit the bar as it, as it cleared. But the bar was higher. Much higher, yes. Yeah, yeah. I agree with all that, except when the bar is as high, as much higher as Princess Mononoke is than Men in Black, then I do think you add in an, an extra dimension of just, like, what did you go for? And then you're like, how difficult is it to achieve that? And I still, I feel like yeah. that makes it. I think when we're talking about bars, I think Princess Mononoke might have one of, if not the highest set bar yeah. of these movies. Because it is doing a story that is, like, uh, who can say whether or not humans or nature are, yeah. like, <laughs> are like able to exist together? The bar together. is high, yes. Yeah. The, bar is, the bar is high. Isn't that what Men in Black is saying? Isn't it, though, when you really But I do it? agree, Ryan, that what Men in Black set out to be was visually interesting, uh, very funny, um, action-oriented. Like, it basically succeeds in every single thing that it tries to do, and so it's an accomplishment. So if uh, I'm not, I don't know what Ebert gave these movies, but if Ebert thought the way that I do about these two movies, that means that Men in Black gets four stars and Mononoke gets three and a half stars. Yeah. But I don't even uh, like that. Doesn't necessarily mean that one, like Men in Black, should win. Yeah, I just think I, I guess I'm just trying to like give it a little bit more screen time of praise. I think the thing mm. that should should factor into what we're talking about is that Men in Black owned '97, and I don't think I ever heard about this movie in '97. I mean, uh, that and that's kind of the way it is with all these Studio Ghibli movies, like. Right? When was the first time that they entered like the American zeitgeist for dum dums like me, not people who were like mm-hmm. are fans of on the pulse? Yeah, I think I think like the very early two thousands when they they really started Disney really started doing the push with uh, like, hey, we're gonna redo all of the like voiceovers with these, but just way worse. I did yeah. check for this one. I was off on or the board was off on Totoro. Like that was sort of later than eighty eight, but uh-huh. we included it because that's when it came out in Japan. Uh, for this one, this one was released with Claire Danes and Billy Bob Thornton in 97. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, wow. And I think that if we were in high school and paid a little bit more attention to, like, the folders of those geeky people, uh-huh. we would have seen it. But, yeah. like, it was just not on our radar at the time. Whereas Men in Black, like, you couldn't buy Doritos without, like, yeah. being inundated with Men in Black imagery. The, and that, it was on the. It was on our radios. The, the, yeah. It was on our MTVs. Yeah. The eye flash thing is now just like a broad cultural touchstone. Yeah, like that, like that is when you think about memory loss. That is the thing, mm-hmm. and that's yeah. where Vincent D'Onofrio uh, made up his kingpin voice. Mm-hmm. That was the first time we ever got to hear it. <laughs> I'm the kingpin now, and I'm also I a big s- roach. Sugar. I will water. say, Men in Black is the reverse contact. We're going in, so if contact fell, if we're all like, yeah, and then we watched it. Men in Black, it was going to be like, okay, let's watch this. And I watched it, I was like, holy shit! I agree Men with that. Men in fucking Black! Uh, yeah, I totally agree I agree, too, that. and I thought that Titanic was going to be that for me in this season. Because I did still sort of like it, but Men in Black is half the length uh-huh. and uh, is like accomplishes as much entertaining. And I know we talk about the length of movies a lot, but it really does matter. Yeah. You have 90 minutes of basically only fun with this movie versus like three plus hours of like kind of arduous viewing with some others. And I think there was a thing in our past, which is what this, our podcast focuses on where they thought long equals good. Yeah. So like if we were to do 95 and we were to do Braveheart, Mm -hmm. which is like really thinks that long equals good. I think it's going to be punishing. Yeah. Way more than Titanic. But I am going to call it to a vote. Maybe not the slam dunk that I thought, that we both thought, Taylor. Huh? Maybe we're both freaking idiots. <laughs> Mike, which do you think should move on? Uh, I will always throw Men in Black on again. I've watched the video a thousand times since we did the show. 
Really? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. A lot. We're trying to learn the dance at my household, but uh, it's actually very easy. We're try- we, we're mastering the dance. It's Princess Mononoke. <laughs> Man, that made me nervous. Yeah. If you said Men in Black, I don't know. Because but... then Men in Black's probably moving on, <laughs> yeah. right, Ryan? <laughs> but no, like, I think that the bar argument is a good argument, but ultimately the height of Mononoke's bar is what's going to take it down. Yeah, right, because the, if, if it were just trying to achieve a little bit more, that'd be one thing, but it's trying to achieve a lot more, right? right? I mean, Braveheart is boring because it's so long, whereas Mononoke is setting up an entire, like, tons of worlds like yeah. three different societies modern okay feels like a very small window into a yeah. vast <laughs> world full of tons of crazy conflict that we never went back to yeah they were like that's all you get guys instead yeah. of saying this is going to start a cinematic universe and that makes it feel vaster mm-hmm. really you know because there, there are so many things that there is no answer for and then those questions make it feel like a real place taylor yep it doesn't really matter what you would say, but I want to know if it's a, cl- a clean sweep for Mononoke. And it I, absolutely is. It absolutely is, right? It's absolutely Mononoke. And I do think this was a slam dunk, but that's not ag- anything against Men in Black. Men in Black, yeah, yes. definitely wins the award for like most improved. Um, it it was, was the anti-contact. Also wins the award for best single letter names of main characters. There sure. you go. Con- congratulations. Come by the studio and pick that up. Well, that is the end of our first round. Ryan, will you give us the winners, please? Of course I will. Greg? I know you will, but would you just say them after, after I'm done saying this? I will. It's uh, LA Confidential. Yeah. Jackie Brown. Woo. Goodwill Hunting. <laughs> All right. Is it? No, Contact. 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 <laughs> and Princess Mononoke. Okay. Uh, Does anybody else want to try? <laughs> yeah. How about this? Uh, it's LA Confidential. Yeah. Jackie Brown. Right. Uh, contact. Good. And Princess Mononoke. Wow. <laughs> T-Money. So well done. But, Ryan, you're my best friend, but Thanks, I bud. think you did a great job as well. Ryan. Ryan, are you ever on the internet? I do love the internet. What is – give me one site you like to go to. I like to – I actually – I didn't know there was more than one. I just – Yeah, dude, they got – they put a couple more up. I don't care about those. I only care about yourpotfilter.com. It is the place to go for all the podcasts that we write, all of the articles we record, all of your opinions about pop culture are at yourpotfilter.com. Wow, your one-stop shop for what you think about pop. And also, Ryan, where's another place? If you're going to go to one other place on the internet. I would go to yourpotfilter.com because like, that's the only place I know. Right. And then I would put a slash Amazon there. Nice. And then that will take you to a new website, I guess, I'm told. Uh-huh. And if you buy stuff from there, that's like one of these uh, put things in your little imaginary shopping cart websites. Uh-huh. Um, we will get a little chunk of that change. Yourpotfilter.com wow. slash Amazon. What a good deal. T-Money, you're on yeah. this podcast. I sure am. Do you ever listen to any other podcasts? Be honest. Mm, occasionally, I do a little uh, little podcast cheating. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Don't say it like that. <laughs> say it. Say it some other way. Uh, I'm I'm a little podcast unfaithful. Uh, but sometimes I like to listen to the Superhero Hour Hour because it's a show that I do, and I like to listen to my own voice. <laughs> we talk about every live action television show based on a comic book or comic book property. I also never listen to, but still subscribe to the OCD podcast where Mike and Ryan talk about the you television show The OC. But it's not that you, you don't need to publicly tell people you don't listen to the show. <laughs> yeah, what? that seemed hurtful. Oh no! If everybody listening right. subscribes and doesn't listen, I'm fine. Like that's good. <laughs> yeah, you just gotta subscribe. Uh, if you find yourself on the internet and you want to do some social media, you can go to Twitter, where we are at yourpopfilter.com, or Instagram, we are at yourpopfilter, not the dot com, just at yourpopfilter, at yourpopfilter, both places. Check us out. It's good stuff. Or if you want to email us, it's contacts at yourpopfilter.com. That's what that one goes to. And then if you want to call us, first of all, are you from 1997? You're going to use your phone to make a call? Grandpa? Are you out there, Grandpa? <laughs> Grandpa, come home. We miss you. But you can call 1562-DR-DJ-POP. That's 1562-DR-DJ-POP. Stay tuned. Or you can't stay tuned now. You have to stop listening to this because this show's over. But next week, we are going to have the last round, and we will determine 1997's movie of the year. Until then, listeners, keep watching them movies. I'll put put that exit music here.